Welcome to Lecture 5 of ECE 4305, Software Defined Radio Systems and Analysis. In this lecture, we will study the concept of noise. Specifically, we will develop a statistical framework for characterizing and analyzing noise. Then, we will focus on one type of noise, referred to as additive white Gaussian noise, or AWGN. Finally, we'll examine the narrowband noise concept and look at two representations of it. So what is noise? Noise, by definition, is an unwanted signal that is superimposed on top of a useful information signal. So um, noise essentially is a type of signal that gets added to or somehow affects a desired or target signal and potentially could corrupt it in such a way that at the receiver, if we're trying to decode or demodulate it, could cause some problems, including an erroneous um, translation of what that waveform is into its binary representation. So in this case, mo noise mo is modeled usually as a random variable. And so what is a random variable? A random variable, as I'll explain in a few slides, is, can be, can, is, is some sort of phenomenon that does not have any sort of like the, the deterministic traits that can be um, uh, re readily predicted or uh, known in advance. However, the statistical characteristics or behavior uh, of a random variable uh, does follow some sort of mathematical model and we can use that as a tool. So we won't know the exact value or behavior of a random variable, but we can know its sort of probabilistic nature in, 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 in essence. So noise um, being an unwanted signal in a lot of cases is actually very random. It's, it's, um, we, we don't know what it is exactly. It's not deterministic and it's often modeled as a random variable. It's often modeled as a random phenomenon that's added to our signal. And although we don't know what it is exactly, we can make um, uh, some sort of, we can get some sort of understanding of it um, in terms of its uh, statistical behavior. So I mentioned noise um, it, it, it can be modeled as a random variable. So, so by random, um, we're basically saying that we, we don't know in advance what it's going to look like exactly. Um, and, uh, as, but we do know that if it is present, it could cause problems to um, our digital communication system in terms of successfully decoding uh, intercepted uh, signals. Um, so where does noise come from? And, and that too. Um, is kind of an issue because what happens is um, noise really uh, comes from a variety of different sources, both um, uh, human uh, made as well as natural uh, when dealing with digital communication systems. For instance, like natural sources of noise include things such as solar flare activity, which sure, it's, uh, that's not totally random um, uh, because we do know when solar flares uh, do occur and we have like some sort of advanced warning, but we don't know exactly how that um, ionization of the um, Earth's atmosphere can uh, be affected, especially when we do wireless communications. Um, there's also something called the John Johnson Nyquist noise, which is literally the excitation of electrons in conductive materials. Like uh, um, how much more random can that be? Like, uh, do we know exactly what the excitation is of every particular electron in, in the metallic structure or whatever sort of um, conductive material used in the communication system, including the antennas? Absolutely not. So wonderfully random. Lightning, um, also a random source. Even cosmic background noise. All of these uh, contribute to the um, um, uh, uh, noise that uh, can p potentially negatively influence uh, the reception of uh, digital communication um, systems uh, uh, and uh, intercepting uh, data transmissions. There's also human sources as well. And um, uh, we talked a little bit before about regulatory requirements and um, they help a lot in terms of minimizing any sort of man, uh, you know, human-made noise that is uh, could potentially interfere with uh, data uh, data, uh, data transmissions. Um, uh, but some 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 are still out there. Like for instance, microwave ovens, 2.4 to 2.5 gigahertz. There's a reason why uh, 2.4 to 2.5 is unlicensed because with microwave ovens operating at the same frequencies, 
that creates quite a bit of noise and makes it uh, somewhat unreliable, especially if it's a commercial wireless um, service or application that's being uh, offered in that same frequency. So, so hence it's an uh, unlicensed band. Um, transmission lines, uh, th they do actually, um, especially because of uh, um, uh, if they support AC currents, um, the, the, the issue with them is they actually uh, are, can become, especially for very long stretches of transmission lines on the order of hundreds and thousands of kilometers long, um, essentially become antennas and uh, they, they uh, emit 60 hertz um, uh, noise. And then and other sort of wireless transmissions in the area. So you might not think about it, but if there's any other sort of wireless system that's operating in frequencies near to the intended uh, frequency band that you hope to broadcast across, uh, that could also potentially bring some issues, especially what we talked about before with respect to out-of-band emissions. So let's take a closer look at how noise um, affects a time domain signal. This is just one example and it's just for illustrative purposes, but just to show uh, how noise can be a, a problem in terms of uh, influencing um, uh, the reception, uh, you know, the receiver of a digital communication system and how um, we could potentially uh, decode the wrong uh, binary pattern if there's noise, uh, a sufficient amount of noise present in the, uh, in, in the system. So let's illustrate the impact of noise on, on the uh, transmission and more importantly, the reception of, um, of a waveform. So in the time domain, suppose we send a very simple waveform, okay? So in this case, we have these rectangular pulses and the rectangular pulses, if they're above the time axis, right, this horizontal axis, um, it's decoded as a one. And if it's below the time axis, it's decoded as a zero. So right now I am transmitting one, zero, zero, one, zero. Now, uh, this is all great. Uh, however, suppose now I introduce some sort of noise to this uh, signal, right? And let's say, Let's say I exaggerate the amount of noise that's introduced. So, um, but but I uh, and to the extent where uh, we create a lot of corruption of the waveform. So superimposing, adding to this signal, some uh, an excessive amount of noise. What we get is something that looks like this. And suppose that's at zero. That's at t, two t, three t, four t, five t. And we do that here, the same thing, 2t, 3t, 4t, 5t. What you can see is, sure, there's like general trends, like in this time interval, it's mostly above the time axis, so you can classify it as a one. Um, and in this time interval, most of it, or almost all of it's below the time axis, so it's a zero. Um, this, again, most of it is above, so you can classify as a one. But how about these like indeterminate cases where the noise basically confuses the receiver, which is trying to decide, is a one or a zero transmitted based on what I'm receiving? Very simple decision, right? Threshold decision. Above the axis, one. Below the axis, zero. How about these like weird situations within a time period where it's on both sides. Hmm, what could it be? That is the issue with noise. You've got clean, crisp, clear, precise signal coming out of the transmitter. When it's received at the receiver, all that noise superimposed on top of it. If it's excessive, that's when we get to experience something like a bit error. So it's these situations here that it's, it's we're trying to figure out, okay, What's going on here? And that, that is the impact of noise on um, a, a transmission. That's just, this is just a simple example. There are uh, uh, other cases where noise can also impair um, the reception of a transmitted signal in other ways as well. But this, this just sort of illustrates how noise can uh, potentially mess things up by corrupting the decision-making process at the receiver by being introduced to the transmitted signal we're trying to decode. So we talked a little bit about random variables 
And, um, and one of the uh, recommended background for this course is having some sort of understanding of probability theory and, uh, and, and, and this is where it primarily comes up first, which is uh, noise, which is um, a stochastic or random uh, event that, is, um, that we need to really understand. And um, especially when we're trying to do things like performance analysis of digital communication systems. Um, so the first question we ask ourselves, right, in terms of uh, random variables is, which one? Um, what I mean to say is, uh, there's not just one type of random variable. And we, we usually classify random variables based on their statistical characteristics. And uh, funny enough, there actually exists a wide range of random variable types, each one possessing a different type of statistical characteristic. And in this course, we will be using almost exclusively one type of random variable in order to characterize um, how, uh, you know, the statistical behavior of noise that's introduced to the digital communication um, uh, signal, which is Gaussian random variables. Okay. So uh, what is ga a Gaussian? So a Gaussian uh, random variable um, is, is usually characterized by something called a probability density function, or PDF. And what a P, uh, the PDF represents is, and, and I'll, I'll draw this in a, in a, in a few seconds, um, the PDF essentially describes with what probability a particular value would be produced by that random variable across all possible values. So essentially, it's a density. Okay, so. Uh, as we'll see, um, uh, it, you know, for every possible value that uh, the random variable can produce, it has an associated probability of occurring. And that's uh, a precise way of 100% characterizing the statistical nature of a random variable. Um, Gaussian PDFs are really, uh, are, you know, whether you realize it or not, are actually um, uh, used extensively even outside of digital communications. Like uh, the most famous example is the bell curve, um, which um, the Gaussian PDF actually looks uh, very uh, similar to. And in fact, if you plot equation one here, uh, which is the PDF of a Gaussian, where mu of x is the mean of that, of that Gaussian PDF, and sigma x squared is the variance of that Gaussian PDF, what you get is a bell curve. So let's look at this idea of the random variable as a black box, okay? so. Black box, we don't know what's inside of it. Let's give it a label, black box. And uh, suppose it's called X, right? Just like the random variable. What it does is it spits out deterministic values, but we don't know which one it's spitting out. We call it little X. So what happens is let's, let's keep track of little X and, and sort of do a histogram based on the x values that are being produced by this black box. And suppose over time, over a lot of outputs from this black box, we get something that looks okay, something that looks like this. Okay, this is great. Now, um, suppose that x is not an integer value, but is actually in an infinite continuum of values, right? And we monitor, like, for a very long time the values in, in, to the extent that we can actually, through some sort of limit, be able to extract what is the exact function of, of how this guy looks like. So what ends up happening is, from this sort of histogram approach, we can produce something that is essentially a density function. So what is this density function? What does this mean? So this density function tells me that for a value of x on the, this x-axis here, um, we can draw a little vertical line and the, basically the height of the, uh, of the point that corresponds to that value on the x-axis tells me the likelihood, the probability that that point, the black box will produce a value that's equal to that point, and for all possible points. So basically, the shape of the curve 
that corresponds to these values of x tells you how much is likely that that value is going to be produced at the output of the black box. So we'll have a high likelihood of this value being produced at the output of the black box and a very, very low probability that these values here are going to be produced by that black box x. Okay, So that black box, which represents our random variable, okay, produces these values when we query it. And so this density or probability density function defines or characterizes 100% how that random variable will behave. The reason why I chose this bell curve looking random variable or uh, a PDF is essentially because this is your Gaussian PDF. So if you had a Gaussian Gaussian random variable, it would have a PDF that looks like this. It would have a mean, it would have a variance and a standard deviation, and the tails. We call these beautiful things the tails. Okay? Because later on, um, we'll be dealing with things called tail probabilities. This is when we compute probabilities of error. We normally want to calculate um, what is the probability of the black box producing a value from let's say some fixed point off to plus infinity and that will be basically the entire tail or minus infinity. Okay. Last but not least, suppose I want to compute the probability of my black box X producing a value between A and B. How would I get that value? What, how would I get the probability of that black box producing a value between these two? We would integrate, we would sum all these individual probabilities and integration is is a sum across an infinite number of points between these two limits and that would give me the probability that x produces a value between a and b so it's it's great that we have this um you know this sort of mathematical representation of the statistical behavior of a random variable, uh, especially if it's like, let's say, noise and its impact on a desired or target signal that's being um, handled by a digital communication system, like a transmitter or receiver. But, but um, so what? That, the, you know, well, what, what, what's really the uh, purpose of these mathematical models? Well, one great thing about things like the PDF is that we can compute the probability of specific values being produced by the uh, by, by these random variables. Like for instance, that, that bell curve PDF we saw of the Gaussian uh, random variable. Um, if I wanted to compute what is the probability of that Gaussian random variable producing a value between three and four, specifically three and four, what I would do is integrate under the PDF curve all values between three and four. And that would give me the probability of that random variable producing a number between three and four. So it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful tool for computing the probabilities of, of, uh, of, of random variables producing values. And this will be very useful when we perform, when we conduct performance analyses of digital communications later on, especially when we have random variables uh, representing things like noise and such being included in that. Um, in the case of a Gaussian PDF, Unfortunately, there is no closed form solution for the Gaussian PDF. It's a, it's a rather um, messy mathematical expression uh, that doesn't yield uh, anything um, pretty. So um, as a result, um, in the digital communications world, uh, we usually use the shorthand um, for representing the answer of the integral of um, a Gaussian PDF in order to calculate the probability of something uh, using something called the Q function, which is described here at equation three. And so you know, the Q function is really the, uh, um, if let's say someone asks you, hey, can, can you compute to me uh, the uh, probability that this Gaussian random variable produces a value greater than four? Um, giving the answer in terms of Q functions is, is a totally legitimate way of uh, providing a solution to them. Uh, there is no closed form solution otherwise. Okay, so uh, with a digital communication system, and um, dealing with uh, noisy sources and such, we're always concerned about whether the noise at different time instances has any relationship with each other. 
And so what we want to know is, in particular, um, is is there are the two samples in time of the noisy uh, the noise being added to to our uh, to the transmission um, are they correlated or are they not correlated? If they're not correlated, if they're uncorrelated, we refer to that type of noise as uncorrelated or white noise. And so, what what is white? Where where does the term white come from? Well, white refers to this idea that the um, uh, in physics. Uh, and electromagnetism, when we deal with like white light, um, what colors does white light contain? And the answer is all of them. Similarly, if we take the Fourier transform of the correlation function of a random variable, a random process, what we find is that um, it produces something called a power spectral density um, of that um, uh, of of that uh, of that correlation function, and that power spectral density will be flat, which means that um, all frequencies uh, for that power spectral density are, have the, the same amount of energy contained within them, just like natural light. And so, whenever we have power spectral densities that are flat, um, we know right away that the random ran, random uh, random uh, process random variable is uncorrelated and uh, we refer to it as white. In this case, if noise has a power spectral density that is white, uh, I mean that is, that ha that is flat, we refer to it as white noise. Okay? And, and, and what is the correlation function? What is that gonna be equal to? So what is the inverse Fourier transform of something that's, uh, as, of a power spectral density that's constant across all frequency? It is a delta function. It should be noted that um, uncorrelated and independence, which is another um, type of characteristic that uh, describes uh, certain types of random variables and random processes, um, are equivalent only when we are dealing with Gaussian random variables. Okay. So finally, um, uh, you know, so so we're trying to sort of um, define each letter in AWGN, so additive white Gaussian noise. The last of the letters that ha has yet to be defined, and we're going to define right now, is the A, additive. So additive usually describes a way that we introduce noise to the transmission. In this way, we basically superimpose um, the, the, the noise signal, NT, on top of the transmission, uh, S of T, in order to yield the corrupted um, signal that's received by a receiver called R of T, and, and I'll, I'll draw that uh, right now. So how would we model uh, the trans, uh, you know, the in introduction of noise into a transmission? Well, suppose this is our transmitter, right? RF front end, baseband functionality, and all the like. And here's your receiver, exact same thing. Transmitter, this guy here sends a signal S of T, okay? So that's passband, analog, waveform, over the air, and ultimately, we would love it to be received by the receiver. Now, somewhere along the lines, we call this area the channel, the propagation channel, basically, when, or transmission channel, where that signal, S of T, whether it's over a copper line, over a fiber optic cable, or over the air, like in a wireless channel, um, experiences a lot of interference, noise, and other sources of distortion that are introduced to the transmission. In this case, if we have additive noise, we would add a waveform, N of T, to S of T, and R of T, which is equal to S of T plus N of T, would be received by a receiver. That, folks, that received signal is the corrupted transmitted signal with that noise, N of T. And that's our additive noise channel. Now that we've looked at sort of fundamentals of noise, we looked at a little bit at random variables, and in particular the Gaussian random variable, and the AWGN, uh, the additive white Gaussian noise. Um, we're going to conclude this lecture with a, a, a brief introduction to the concept of narrowband noise. Okay? So most transmissions that we deal with are band limited. That means that we don't have signals that 
occupy an infinite amount of frequency or, um, uh, or wireless spectrum. Rather, um, in a lot of cases, we're usually constrained to a very finite, very small amount of frequency in order to transmit our signals across. Okay, and, um, and in some ways that's great because what happens is um, even though noise is, uh, is, is present everywhere across frequency when we transmit over a medium like the air or a copper wire or fiber optic cable, um, when, we tr when we have a narrow band transmission uh, at the receiver the, which filters out everything except the, the specific narrow band um, signal that we're trying to decode, we only have to deal with the noise that's located within that narrow band um, uh, uh, frequency. The only problem is we need a mathematical model that can represent um, uh, the behavior, statistical behavior of that narrow band noise, the noise that got filtered out in the filtering process at the receiver and is part of our intercepted transmission. So what we need to do is we need to figure out um, uh, how, how to deal with noise uh, that, that looks like that. Because when we have white noise in a wideband environment where um, it's, uh, the power spectral density is nice and flat and, um, uh, and the samples are uncorrelated, that's one thing. But when we deal with narrowband noise, um, this is no longer white. It actually um, creates some very interesting um, issues. So uh, what we need to do is we need to figure out um, how, for, uh, like how, how to represent uh, this noise. Um, and because, uh, you know, uh, and part of this course is about uh, the mathematical tools used to sort of analyze and characterize digital communication systems and having an accurate representation of noise is quite important in order to have an accurate assessment of the performance of these systems. So um, for narrowband noise, we can have one of two possible representations. There's something called in-phase and quadrature representation, IQ. Um, an IQ representation is essentially equivalent to, uh, in two dimensions, uh, Cartesian coordinates, right? We, we have something that represents the X and something that represents the Y. In this case, IQ uh, usually refers to, let's say, a real and an imaginary component of noise at, at baseband frequencies. The other representation is um, suppose, you know, in, in, in calculus or in pre-calculus, we usually, um, if we want to work in another type of coordinate system, uh, we usually translate um, or come up with a, sort of a mathematical expression that relates uh, one coordinate system to another. Um, in, uh, when we want to convert something like a Cartesian coordinate to a spherical coordinate, we usually go through several uh, mathematical expressions in order to go from the xy to the radius and um, um, uh, angle representation. Uh, envelope and phase is exactly uh, uh, the, the same sort of, uh, is in exact same sort of spirit as that conversion from Cartesian to spherical coordinates. What we're doing is we're taking in phase and quadrature representation and translating it into this um, uh, polar or spherical uh, representation in two dimensions. So like looking at the second bullet, um, uh, what we can do is we can easily represent like the A plus JB, which is our in-phase representation. So we have a real component, that's the in-phase, and we have an imaginary component, that's the quadrature of the noise, and we can represent it in terms of some sort of radial arm or magnitude, A, and some phase uh, or, or uh, angular displacement from the uh, x-axis, um, phi. And uh, it has the following relationships listed below. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at um, first in phase and quadrature representation of narrow band noise and then we're going to convert it later on into the um, uh, envelope and phase representation. So um, suppose we have um, our, our narrow band IQ representation of noise and uh, suppose that uh, NT uh, 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 tilde is equal to n i of t plus j n q of t. So we have our in phase or real portion of noise and our uh, imaginary or uh, quadrature component of noise. And so, so at the ba complex baseband, we can represent noise as a complex random variable. Now, um, when we modulate to some sort of uh, 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 passband representation, like when we upconvert to RF frequencies and whatnot, 
uh, we take that complex baseband representation, we modulate it by multiplying it by a complex exponential, like e to the j 2 pi f c of t, and then take the real portion of that. We know that a complex exponential by Euler's relationship is equal to a sum of a, cos a cosine plus j sine component. And so that gives us equation six at the, at, at the bottom. But now the, the, the real question is, how do we get ni of t and nq of t from, uh, let's say, from something like n of t? Okay. So, so in order to do that, like we have several very useful properties for the IQ representation of noise. Okay? And, and I've listed a few here, but the ones that you should really pay attention to are uh, the ones in involving the power spectral density. We'll talk more about power spectral density in lecture, le lecture six, but the PSD um, of, of I, uh, NI and NQ, it's interesting. Um, they are identical to each other, uh, just modulated to different uh, uh, center frequencies. And, and there are a few other uh, properties that are listed here, including also what the uh, cross-spectral density is, equation eight down below. Now, if we want to convert um, the in-phase and quadrature representation of noise into uh, an envelope phase representation, uh, we need to do a, a sort of a change of coordinate system, exactly like we would have done in pre-calculus or a calculus class. We would essentially, um, replace, let's say, the um, um, x and y representation, um, and, uh, or let's say, in this case, the ni and nq representation with an, um, uh, uh, with an r and a phi representation. Um, so, so it's almost like a plug and chug, with the exception of one thing, which is the calculation of the Jacobian, which is a, a determinant of the partial, uh, a partial derivatives uh, of ni and nq with respect to r and phi. So that's vitally important. But what we find is, suppose we have um, uh, the, the, the joint PDF, the joint probability density function of our noise is actually is a two-dimensional Gaussian random variable, right? Um, and that's what's represented in equation 10. If we convert it to uh, the polar coordinates to an R and phi representation, envelope and phase representation, what do we get? What it turns out is equation 11 uh, that uh, with the exception of the uh, 1 over 2 pi sigma squared term in the denominator in the fraction at the beginning, the, the rest of that is actually the, the PDF of a Rayleigh random variable. And the 1 over 2 pi sigma squared is, uh, is, is that of the uniform random variable for the phase. 